conductive wire And you were so electric I had no say when you came so near And just passed right through me Hey everyone, welcome to Geekdom is Back. Today I am joined by Derek Denny and Becky Rice. <laughs> and today we're talking about Black Widow, which just came out like four days ago, five days ago, six days ago. I don't know what day of the week it is ever anymore, but we're here to talk about that today. Derek and Becky, how are you doing? I'm good. Um, I'm excited. I'm excited to be back at the movies. I know all three of us have been to the movies before, but this is the first like Marvel movie back. Um, and I don't think I realized how long it had been or how long it felt like since we'd had this Marvel content. Obviously, there's shows on, but it just it hits different. It's good to be back. And it's it's amazing to like get to, to talk about like an actual MCU movie where it's not just people complaining on Twitter. Like you get to have a have a real discussion and, and get into the exciting bits. And I feel like Black Widow gave us a lot of exciting stuff to talk about. I think so. And it's an interesting one for them to kind of kickstart the movies with again, because it's a character we already know. It's a character who I think a lot of people have always wanted to see more of and have her own movie. And the fact that they technically waited until after she was dead, which I totally forgot about the entire movie. <laughs> because I was like, oh, this is great. I was like, oh, but she's still dead. So. Yeah. There's so much MCU stuff that I feel like I've forgotten. Like if it's not related to the TV shows, then just like during COVID, I kind of took a break from it and didn't think about it for a long time. Look, if you haven't seen this movie, it's Tuesday. The movie came out Thursday. If you haven't seen it, don't listen to this. Save it and come back to it later. But in the end credit scene... I was very thrown off for like a few seconds because I was like, wait, what? And I was like, oh, <laughs> you dummy. You missed an entire, you forgot about an entire movie. And yeah, so that was wacky. I also, to what you're saying, Deanna, about how like it feels late because right, like she's like dead in the like MCU now. I feel like it's late because this is something that people were asking for like as early as when we first met her. Since like Winter Soldier, at least for sure. At least since Winter Soldier, which, by the way, I have, like, gripes about, like, that, too, uh, because I stand Bucky and Natasha, and, like, that's never going to happen in these movies, right? Like, that's going to be a thing that's just in the comics, and so I have, like, it's fine. Well, to be fair, I'm pretty sure Falcon and Winter Soldier made it clear that, that Bucky is just never going to find happiness with anyone. But him and Natasha love each other because they learn that they can, even though they've been programmed and conditioned psychologically to like not care about other people, that that's not who they have to be forever. And they're a really great couple. Which, touching on that before we dive into the cast, they kind of go through that with her in this movie. Like, they explain that she's not the same person she was because she was able to get away. And I really like that. So you obviously have Scarlett Johansson coming back as Natasha, but they add so many characters to this. And Becky, real quick, I know you and I talked about Haunting of Bly Manor, and they had little Violet McGraw on this, who was like the perfect young yes. Yelena. Like, I looked at her and then I saw Florence Pugh and I was like, oh, she's just going to grow up to be her, right? <laughs> like, I had no idea about the children casting um, in this film. And as soon as I saw her, I was just like, whoa. Like, very good casting. Like, I look at Violet McGraw and I'm like, okay, yeah. Like, it makes sense to me that this child grows up and looks like Florence Pugh. And so A plus there, the girl that they cast to play Natasha, I think it's more of like a oh, okay, like, mm, I don't know. But it's not so alarming that you can't see it because especially that scene when it like transitions over, right? And it like closes up on like her face and like her eyes are closing and then they open and it's actually Natasha. Like, and that, I did not see it until that transition. And then once that transition happened, I was like, oh, actually that was also very good child casting. That that child also looks like they will grow up to look like Scarlett Johansson. I just didn't see it until that transition happened. Yeah, it was really good. Derek, what did you think of the additions of Rachel Weiss and David Harbour? I mean, it was it was perfect. And I mean, you look at the cast in this movie, and even though it's a film set so much um, 
so much further behind in in the current um, MCU storyline. They went out and they got big names who can easily appear in future films. And when they show up, it's going to be like, oh yeah, of course, you know, of, of course we're going to see more of David Harbour or Rachel Weisz because they're amazing actors and you don't get them just for a one-off. You get them thinking that, okay, later, later down the line, oh, we got to go back to, to Russia for some sort of storyline. All right, we're going to throw one of these people in there and they're going to kill it just like they did in this movie. Marvel has been so good at casting for so many of these roles. When you look at who they've casted, you know, as Iron Man, Captain America, even Scarlet's casting, the fact that these people aren't getting tired of these roles, too, necessarily, after, what, 10, 15, 20 years for some of them, it's like kind of crazy not 20 years but whatever you all know what i mean (laughs) i mean iron man was what 2008 so he was probably working on it 2007 maybe cast 2006 so 15 possibly yeah and it's taken until 2021 for robert downey jr to to kind of be like all right i'm done i'm unfollowing everyone on social media i'm good you you take the ball and you run from here yeah but I thought this movie was very well casted. William Hurt somehow always looks like he's about to die, though. Like, I don't know what it is about him. I feel terrible saying this, but it's just like every time I see him in a role, they're like, let's make him look as old as humanly possible, (laughs) but still alive. I think it's getting to the point where every time I, I see Thunderbolt Ross, it's like, they need to like get the Thunderbolt story going like real quick because I don't know if he's going to be able to do it five years down the line. I don't know though that they technically necessarily even need him to do that. Right. Like it can just be like, this is where this name comes from. I think it is very clearly being set up as we speak like very heavily, which is fun and exciting. Yeah. Any other casting notes from either of you? Pew, pew! (laughs) More on pew? Yeah! The, yeah! Um, okay. So, I think that this movie should have come out, like, six or seven years ago. That being said, if it did, we would not have had Florence Pew in this movie. And I think she absolutely, like, steals the show. She is so incredible. And I also think that it's very interesting to take a look at like Scarlett Johansson's trajectory as an actress. And then now like Florence Pugh's trajectory as an actress, right? Like you have this like very beautiful, but like really good at handling comedic timing um, indie actress that is now going to be an action star and pulls it off very well. Um, I think that that's very interesting to see the two of them side by side in that way. Um, Because I do think that there are a lot of parallels there. Yeah, um, this isn't necessarily a casting choice, but like a a story change choice. But I think like the decision to make like Yelena and Natasha having known each other as children and like growing up as like somewhat like siblings. um, I think that that was very interesting. To me, I felt like it was super believable when I was when I was watching them, both as as children and the adult actors as well. But yeah, I think Florence P absolutely crushes in this movie. Just out of everyone I've spoken to about this movie, like re- regardless of whether they loved it or they were lukewarm on it, it Pew is is everyone's favorite part. And and she she brings like the relationship between between um uh Yelena and and Natasha, like it it carries the movie especially because like you have you know we have this character black widow who we've seen time and time and time again and she's finally get her get her own film and they needed to give us something that we didn't already know about her and so you pull in this fantastic cast and you let pew and johansson go off on one another to to really give give the emotional investment in the film and it it was by far my favorite part yeah because they wouldn't have been able to just like strictly dig into like the red room stuff because they covered a lot of that in like agent carter and so i think that bringing that in and like you know taking these characters that we already know or well maybe not everybody knows but are already in like the marvel universe and then slightly shifting their like connections to one another 
one of my favorite things is when Marvel takes characters that either aren't very well known or just aren't super well read into and turn those into films or shows because they get more freedom. Like Guardians of the Galaxy, I think is a really great example. I think one of the biggest reasons that movie had very few complaints right out the gate is because it's a series that like just significantly less people are familiar with. And so people can get less upset um, about changes that are made. And I think that this is a really good example of that. Um, Seeing how these characters are connected or connecting to each other. Um, Also Taskmaster. Like I just had a good time at the movies. (laughs) Yeah. And speaking of having a good time at the movies, Derek, you went to the premiere where some of the crew was present for this. So can you tell us a little bit about that before we dive into story? Yeah, um, I'm I'm very lucky. I am a part of a charity cosplay group called the Avengers Initiative, where we're located in Southern California, Northern California, uh, in New York, and I think one or two states kind of in the middle of the country. Um, And we do a lot of we do a lot of like charity work, hospital visits, where we all dress up um, normally as, as Marvel characters. Sometimes we get some DC or some Star Wars thrown in there. Um, and Marvel knows about us. And when they have big uh, big premieres or big events, they reach out to us and, and get us uh, to show up in cosplay. Um, I was fortunate enough to go to the Endgame premiere, and, and that was amazing. And for for Black Widow, I think because of COVID reasons, they didn't do one huge premiere, but they did like a premiere fan event in Australia and one in England and one in New York and one in L.A. Um, And I went to the Los Angeles one. Uh, The directors uh, and the producers were there. Kevin Feige was there. It was it was nuts being able to see Kevin Feige in, in real life and being like, thank you for like giving me all these amazing things in my life over the past decade and a half. And please take care of yourself because I need you in my life for the next like three decades to give me more amazing stories. Um, but it was, but it was awesome. Um, one of my cosplays is Hawkeye. And since Hawkeye and Black Widow have a connection, that's what I wore. And, and it was awesome. Some of the, uh, some of the lesser actors from the film were there, but no one who I, I recognize, but it was great. Just uh, they did it at the El Cap, uh, the El Capitan Theater in Hollywood. I was able to rock the red carpet, get some awesome photos, and it was the first time since before COVID that I was able to like wear my cosplay and go out with other cosplayers and be huge dorks together and run up and down Hollywood wearing hot spandex and, and leather. It's just one of those things that like I can truly tell that that Marvel cares a lot about about the the fans of the the MCU and about this film in particular because it really pulled out all all the stops with all the the cool um, photo ops and swag that they gave out. I'm I'm currently wearing my Black Widow um, global red carpet fan event hat, uh, but it was it was amazing. It also meant that I got to see the movie about two weeks earlier than everyone else so i've been um i've been struggling because i really 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 wanted to talk about this film but no one else can see it but now everyone can see it and they don't even need to leave their home if they want to spend 20 bucks on disney plus i texted derek when i got out of the movie because i went um thursday at like five o'clock dan i think you and i were at the movies roughly around the same time just you know we both went at five but in different time zones yes (laughs) so you were there in hour before me so you got out before i did i texted derek when i got out of the movie actually i was texting him while i was waiting on the credits to roll and i was like wow this in credit scene is really at the end because they've spoiled us right we're like a lot of them the credits will roll for like you know the big names and then there will be like an in-between little cut scene and then and then there's another one at the very end but this one, you had to like wait for it. And I texted Derek and I was like, oh my gosh, like forgot how long the credits and movies were. Yeah, they were like seven minutes or something. I think I timed it. I It was it was a lot. And especially to, like on the Disney Plus shows, you can just skip through until you see a, a, a mid credit and then watch that and then skip all the way to the end. But not in the theater. No, because I missed a little like cutscene thing because I was fast forwarding. I didn't notice that there was like, I didn't see like a little blip or like whatever. And then friend of the podcast, Shane was just like, 
yeah, about that end credit at the end of like that episode of Loki. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, oh, <laughs> you should watch that. And I was like, what end credit, what end scene? Um, and so I had to back up on like, because ep- it was episode four. <laughs> I was like, oh, my bad. Yeah, it was a weird one. And, you know, with the way this story is, this is taking place after Captain America Civil War, because the Avengers have broken up and they're kind of... Yes either in jail or on the run for half of them. And I wasn't sure if they were going to have an end credit scene because I was like, this doesn't lead into the next movie by any means. And then I was reading, I was like, oh, it's an end credits for a Disney Plus thing. That kind of makes way more sense. So for anyone, in case you thought there wasn't going to be one, there is one. We will talk about it later. But because of where this story takes place, I wanted to get your thoughts on the fact that they could have literally just released this after Civil War, and they did not. (laughs) That is my biggest criticism. Like, as much as I enjoyed the film, I couldn't help just sitting in my seat being like, I would have loved this so much more if it came out years ago. Like, why did it take so long for this film to get made? Was it I don't know, Marvel dragging their feet on giving giving a female character her own movie or script issues, probably the the first of those. Um, but that yeah, they, they dropped the ball there. I think that there's a couple of different things. I think while this absolutely could have come out directly after Civil War, I don't know that this is the story that they would have written. I think that this is definitely a story choice that some of the pieces of this story were clearly made later. I also, unfortunately, because I think the same thing happened with Miss Marvel, right? Where we knew that this movie was supposed to be happening, right? Like Captain Marvel? Is it what? I uh, Yeah. They're very different characters, Becky. Uh, Well, she was Miss Marvel before she was Captain Marvel. (laughs) And they just jumped the gun in the movies. For those of you who don't know, I own several key (laughs) issues of, of comics featuring Carol Danvers. So... Don't come at me. There have been a few Miss Marvels. Don't tweet at me. I know what I'm talking about. But when they started talking about it, though, I think it was like a, it was a, it was a, there is a movie, it will feature Carol. And it was very unclear if it was going to be Miss Marvel, Captain Marvel. Um, what I had been expecting for a very long time was that the way that we were introduced to her was going to be through like Guardians of the Galaxy or Guardians of the Galaxy 2. And that then she would get her own film. And then it just kept getting pushed back and it feels like the same thing with this where like people have been asking for this for years and they've been like yeah 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 we'll do something with black widow and we got it and it was good but it would have been way better if we had gotten this movie like in 2017 do you think she needed to be dead in order for them to tell at least the end of this story the way they told it I don't think so, because the whole, I mean, her, I feel like a a Black Widow solo film was always going to be about the Red Room and getting into her history. And she could have, she could have easily have done that before, uh, before Endgame. It just would have changed the end credit scene, mostly. Yeah. Wasn't the original end credits for this different? And then they went back and, and filmed something different. I've heard that it changed over time. That could be true, because when they filmed this, they probably didn't know how well the Disney Plus shows were going to do at the time, I imagine. And this incorporates two of them. So that was definitely like a later edition choice, probably. And probably because they didn't need Scarlet for it. They could do that. Yeah, I think a big thing, too, is that might have also been part of it, is that Marvel has taught us that we can expect one, sometimes two, scenes after a film that will lead into whatever the next movie is um or something that we can expect happening soon and this story is so siloed off which is very much like true for black widow like in the comics where she's very much like in other people's shows or books sorry not shows but like and doesn't really get her own stuff until like the late nineties, early two thousands. And even then most of them are like four to seven issue runs and they're good. And they're interest. They're very interesting. A lot of them, they're not like superhero. y they're very like just straight up like a spy comic, which I really enjoy personally, but how do you tie a story like that back into everything else that's happening in these? I don't know. I wish it had come out sooner, but I feel like the story that we got would have been a very different story and I would have probably ended up liking it less. And I think too, over time, 
like whenever whenever the next big crossover is, whether it's like Secret Wars or Young Avengers, the the big event film, when I inevitably go back and rewatch everything in chronological order, I feel like you know watching this after Civil War, I probably won't have those complaints after some time, and I can go through and kind of watch where this is supposed to land. Because it, it does it does the thing that you always run into the risk of when you go back and do a prequel so far down later in the line. Like it doesn't change any of the history. It doesn't make anything that happens after it chronologically untrue. Um, at the you know the biggest thing is like oh where you know where does Yelena go for the next few years? Well, I'm sure they'll get into that later down the line. And it yeah. <laughs> Yes. I'm whispering so that people have to crank their volume up to hear what I said. And then they'll blow their ears out when they listen to the rest of it and forget to turn it down. Yes. And that's the lesson about the Thunderbolts. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. Mostly yeah. Bad. Mostly bad, but sometimes <laughs> not so bad. It's a bunch of bad guys doing not so bad stuff. Sounds about right. That makes me think like in in Loki. Oh, I won't talk about Loki. I want to, though. But we'll save that for a different episode. I think we all want to talk about Loki all the time. I know. Yes. So I joked in our group text that this movie did a very good Fast and Furious impression (laughs) in multiple scenes because, you know, this whole thing was about family that is not really family. (laughs) And then you have some really good action scenes in this, too. And a few that stood out to me were when she gets to the safe house and her and Yelena go at each other, basically, even though you kind of know, because they showed you that part in the trailer briefly. And they really wanted to make it seem like they were going to pit these two people against each other the entire movie. And I was pleasantly surprised that they decided not to do that. But it's not like they were necessarily getting along super well the entire time either. So there was this tension there. And the car chase scene where the other widows are going after them. I was like, oh, yes, here's the Fast and Furious moment. And they really delivered on both of those things, in my opinion. What did you both think? When she, like, kicks the door off, I was just like, ah! I got really excited. Those landed so well because they were mostly practical effects. Like, those are, you know... And and that kind of gets into the end of the movie, which I won't talk about yet. But but I mean, any any time, any time, uh, you give me tons of action and make it all or make most of it practical, I'm gonna I'm gonna love it. Um, and I feel like even though you knew that um, Yelena and Natasha were gonna get into it, like anyone with a sibling or like a family member who they grew up who they're close to, like you watch that, and you're like, yeah. I know what that feeling is like, you know, I have a younger brother and we got into it and we were kids. And even though it's in a movie and they're superheroes, you still kind of understand what's going on between two siblings who just have beef. I really like the way that they did things at like the dinner table, right? Because it sets up at the very beginning of the film that Natasha was a little bit more like their mom. I mean, she's not their mom, but you know what I mean, right? Like, um, whereas Yelena is a little bit more like their father. And then even though they're very young when they're separated and they go on and like live very different lives. Natasha gets out way earlier than Yelena does. Yelena ends up being not just psychologically controlled, but also chemically controlled. Um, And yet when they all get back together, it is still somewhat true that Natasha is a little bit more like their mom and Yelena is a little bit more like their father. Um, And I like, and I think the way that 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 those scenes are shot and which characters get up versus which characters stay at the table, right? I think it, I think that that's very well done. It's like pure revertigo. Like you get together with like your old friends from high school or your family who haven't seen and you just start acting like you did when you were young versus the person you are now. Yeah. And it's it's funny because like Natasha has, has very clearly had this thing of like, no, I thought about this. I'm like, this, this thing was not real. And again, like she had already been there before they were in Ohio. And then also she was older when they went back. Whereas with Elena being so young, right, she very much was convinced that it actually was her family and had no super firm reason to believe that, like she knew that it wasn't real, you know, but like 
she was still much more attached to that than like she was saying it was real to her at the time exactly yeah and natasha is just like no <laughs> um and then at the at, at the end that kind of like shifts a little bit which is nice i think this movie was paced pretty well too for the story because a thing that a lot of superhero movies do is they all think they need to be over two hours and sure maybe you know 10 minutes or so sh could have been shaved off of this but we go into it knowing that the credits are going to account for like five to 10 minutes of these movies every time, especially when you had something like Infinity War and Endgame, where there were way more CGI things being done in those movies versus this one going a little more practical. But you have this expectation that all of these movies at this point are maybe going to run just a little too long. And I think where they yep. could have cut a few things down was maybe towards the beginning of the movie, it took them a little bit to get into it. I do like that they showed them as kids. I think maybe, you know, shave off a minute or two there and then kind of get to the safe house a little faster. And this movie would have been a little better paced for me. But what did you both think about the pacing? So I would actually say that if I had to shave time, it would come off of the end. Okay. When we start getting action scenes that are like, flipping around in the upper atmosphere like space headquarters i mean it's not in space but like whatever like it just gets to be like maybe a little less skydiving yeah okay. like i was like how long do i need to see them do like freaking flipperoos in the air that stuff like drug on like a bit for me but whereas at the beginning when i was in the moment i was like all right come on like where are we going? But once the once things actually picked up, I was like, oh, okay. Like, I am glad that we spent so much time there. Um, I think it might be one of my favorite openings to, like, a Marvel film. I also am a really big fan of, like, the way that, like, Black Panther opens. I feel like it was perfect because, like, it sets up investment in the family because you're going to need to care later on when they've all split up and they need to reunite as a family. So if you if you cut off time from there, then you don't have that attachment to to wanting to see the family together um the only pacing issue i would have is for a movie that for you know the first two-thirds of it are all mainly like grounded and quote-unquote realistic and at least like not a whole ton of cgi for it to turn into a big cgi fest that takes place on a floaty thing in the sky was kind of jarring and i wish yep that that didn't happen because that I mean that's that was the the weakest part of the film for me and I I under, you know it makes sense oh the the red room is floating in the sky and that's how no one can find it and this and that and it's like okay that makes sense but also you could have put it somewhere else like you could have put it in like Antarctica <laughs> yeah Antarctica or <laughs> Kung Lao, yeah, or somewhere that's like very remote off the grid, um, and not had a bunch of explodey things. I like that it was where it was, right? Like we've already seen, like in like the Marvel universe, that this is a thing that happens, right? So it's not super like obscure necessarily. Right. Um, it makes it very fun because, like, right, like when she's watching like Moonraker and she's like you know, quoting this like James Bond movie. And it's very funny because you're like, oh, okay, this is like a spy thriller and she's watching this like spy film. But then it actually ends up being like, oh no, actually the secret base is actually just above the earth. Um, and it's like, oh, you were telling me that earlier and I did not notice that until later. That's cool. Thank you for that. It's just the action that happens once they're up there. I'm like, this is, it's so unrealistic that it's jarring. But I think that if if we could have just done with significantly less of the like fighting in the air type of stuff, I think it would have been fine. And I don't need my superhero films to feel super realistic. But again, like like you were saying, Derek, like this film is so grounded in reality because Natasha is enhanced, right? Um, but she does not have super powers. Like this is not a film about super power people i mean it's it's a film about like enhanced uh folks but yeah and it makes me worried that i'm like oh my gosh there's gonna be something like ridiculous like in the hawkeye show because that would also jar me because right like these are characters that are a little bit more grounded um than than say like you know 
your Captain Marvels or your anyone with powers. I can't think of. Uh, yeah, I was like, I cannot think of a <laughs> single other superhero because I don't read comic books. Not at all. Mm -mm. Never owned a several hundred dollar comic book in my life. No. Uh, something you said does just kind of make me think. I wonder if we would feel a little different about the end uh, if it did something um, that that Star Wars films always do, where you've got like the big space battle, and then you have like the Jedi lightsaber duel, where you've got like something flat, something happening in the air, and then like hand to hand combat or like face to face. And if if the end were like, okay, you have Taskmaster and you have um black widow fighting somewhere and then up in the sky you have you have um yelena trying to free her family and also take down the red room and explode it and you kind of just went back and forth between those two i wonder if it would have had uh, an effect also that's we, like the first time we brought up taskmaster which i feel like says a lot about how taskmaster was used in the film yeah, it was really weird to me, this use case choice. I, I didn't hate it necessarily, but like you're talking about like a really cool character essentially being used as like a pawn and that's it. Very frequently just referred to as Dracov's starter, which is very interesting because Loki refers to Natasha. Or well, no, I had always thought, we, you're right, like, so there's like a twofold thing. Does Loki know like things about like Natasha? Or did Loki just happen to know about the Red Room? In the Avengers movie, um, she talks about how, like, she's done things that she, like, regrets. And she's hoping to, like, wipe all of that, like, off of her hands. And he's like, can you really get rid of all of that? And then he pauses and he says, Dracov's daughter. And so when I saw that, and again, like, I, I know a little bit about, like, Black Widow. And, like, and so I was like, okay, like, Dracov's going to be whoever they have like in charge of the red room and like the widows. And that's what he means by that. But then I'm like, Oh wait, is that how we're supposed to interpret that? Or are we supposed to interpret that as like Loki knowing something about Natasha Natasha's decision? Like when she was going after Dracov, like that, that was going to happen. Right. Because we're talking about like a time and space character, um, which is interesting to think about anyway. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> My brain has so many things happening in it. Um, I felt a little bit let down by some of the taskmasters that like, it was cool to be like, okay, great. Like you're mimicking like anybody's fighting style. That's cool. I would have loved to see more of that. And then, cause especially like there towards the end, we're told, oh, and she knows how to fight like every single one of your friends. I would have loved to see instead of her mirroring like Natasha every single time, if Natasha had been like, oh, like I've seen this person do this thing, maybe I'll try mixing it up. And then she's very clearly able to be like, nope, I can also do this thing that Cap does. I can also do this thing that Iron Man does. Because what was the point of like letting us know that otherwise? Because it's not like any of the Avengers could have come help her out. They're all like gone right now. And it's not like Red Guardian really had a fighting style. Yeah, his fighting style was <laughs> I'm a super soldier. Yeah. I'm just going to run at you and hope I mow you down. <laughs> that kind of felt like his fighting style. Yep. So there wasn't really anything for Taskmaster to mimic there because it was just like this out of shape man just throwing his weight around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then with, with Taskmaster, like, oh, Taskmaster is able to do that because of this thing that he put in the back of her head and not because... Taskmaster has like a crazy photographic memory and all these like amazing skills that lead to Taskmaster's abilities. Like it's just because, oh no, she almost died in an explosion. So I saved her and turned her into the, my personal robot fighter. Like Taskmaster has a cool yeah. backstory that didn't need to be changed that much. Like making, you know, not using Tony Masters and, and using, um, using someone else fine doesn't bother me at all but like there's lots of cool things about taskmaster that didn't get used and then i always get really frustrated when you take a villain like that and use them for one movie and then by the end they're gone and like maybe we'll get like the tony masters taskmaster showing up in the future with the photographic memory and like with uh one of the the different taskmaster outfits but i i was a little sad that it, it doesn't seem as if we're going to get more Taskmaster. 
Yeah, I don't think that we will because I think that it would be too confusing for a lot of folks. Even having her being Taskmaster, I think like absolutely, I mean, it makes sense, right? Like Taskmaster like is this like mercenary like type villain who has a ton of funding that we're not really sure where it's coming from. It makes absolute sense that this is like a specially selected widow. Yeah, why why couldn't they have her go through the widow program? Because one thing I wasn't clear on, and maybe one or both of you caught this, but when Natasha blew up the building, wasn't he also actually in it, like five feet away from the daughter at his desk? And he's not burned or anything like that. At and all. she was. That's a good point. And I wanted to know if I was crazy and he wasn't actually there, or if they just totally glossed over that and made that the main reason this whole Taskmaster thing was about his daughter almost dying. It didn't track. <laughs> it didn't track. Yeah. yeah, like, it didn't make sense that, like, he was in the same room, but, like, co- very clearly, like, completely unbothered, undamaged in any way. But the rest of it could have been fine. Like, if they were like, oh, like, my daughter almost died and like, in order to, like, that's the other part, too. Like, literally, he was like, he's like, well, you blew her face off and I had to put this chip in the back of her head. And I'm like, those don't equate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what? Like, you had to? She is a person at the end, like, when, you know, when when she is saved at the end, she seems to, like, have cognitive functions and doesn't doesn't need it. Because she was also under the chemical control. So she has a chip in her brain and she's being chemically, like, which I guess all of them had a chip, right? Um, cause we see, we see Elena removing hers from her like leg, the track, like, cause it's a tracker oh, yeah. as well. Um, and that's how they're able to say like, oh, Hey, like she's gone offline. Um, but why is everybody else's implanted into their leg and ta- and taskmaster? Like hers is in the back of her head. What does that have to do with her getting blown up? Like you made the choice to like turn your daughter into this mercenary, by putting her through this program of like, right? Like it it was your decision to say like, the world has too many discarded girls and nobody's gonna miss them because one, they're girls, right? And then two, not all of them, most of them were orphans, right? Most of them were picked up from the streets, but that's not the case with his daughter. That's his daughter. So that is a very wild choice to be like, well, her face is blown up now. Mm, I guess she'll just be a mercenary. I guess it was to be like, I'm going to train her to like avenge me one day, which is okay. Like I I can see how I can, I I, I can see how we got there, but the choice to make that be like a fairly well-known like villain for people who are into like, I would say Spider-Man is probably, I mean, somebody feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but like, I would say that the people who are most familiar with Taskmaster as like a villain or people who are super into like Spider-Man, maybe. I honestly wasn't super familiar with the villain. Uh, Derek, who would who would you most closely associate ta- uh, Taskmaster with? I don't know because to like Taskmaster is is awesome, but because you know because ta- you know, because the character is a mercenary, like Taskmaster just shows up in random things and doesn't have like one main uh, one mm-hmm. main arch enemy. He's not like Rhino or something in the comics. Yeah. Yeah, like, I mean, like, he shows up in, like, a lot of people's different stories, but I feel like there's a lot of overlap with Spider-Man. Yeah. I think because in the comics, he's from the Bronx, so anyone Mm -hmm. who's in New York, probably, and, you know, Spider-Man's, like, one of the biggest New York characters for Marvel, so that makes sense. It's just a weird choice. Yeah. I thought I was, like, missing a piece of the story somewhere, and I was like, did I not see something did i like space out for a minute or two so i'm glad it wasn't just me and that you both are on the same page because i was like sometimes i miss things <laughs> it was one that i was like it was almost there it was almost a good decision it's just hard to understand what the point was if now like that's gone because it's not like they're setting up that like oh we're gonna have this character be part of thunderbolts because clearly like yelena is and we'll talk about this I'm sure, but like, or maybe we won't, but like Yelena, I think clearly is going to be part of Thunderbolts. Um, it would not make sense to have two reformed widows in that. So like, they could have had her be like a widow that had like her face altered or wore like there's face cloaking technology that they have, right? 
why the choice to make her taskmaster? Like I, cause as soon as I saw like the like helmet, I was like, oh shit. Okay. Yeah. Like let's go. And then I would just felt very let down. That is absolutely my, my biggest criticism of, of the film. I'm also curious how soon did you figure out that she was taskmaster? Cause I feel like the second that we learned that his daughter was in the building and it explodes and it's like, Oh, that's, she's gonna be taskmaster because if you don't see someone die on screen, then they're not actually dead. So I, I was kind of, it feels like it, it took away some of the surprise later on in the film when she's revealed. Cause it was like, Oh yeah, I, I kind of guessed. Especially because Yelena points that out too. She was like, did you ID the, body did you confirm the death and natasha was like no there was no body (laughs) yeah so we're like immediately thinking oh those people aren't dead then especially dracov so i thought you know it wasn't a surprise at all when she takes off that helmet and you're like yep that okay that makes sense given what they gave us but why is the part that does not make sense necessarily as much but I know the three of us could probably talk about this movie for like half a day, and I I don't want to edit that much, but (laughs) are there any other story points that either of you want to touch on? We kind of touched on the family aspect of this. Do you want to dig deeper into any of those characters before we talk about some Easter eggs here? I think the story is pretty straightforward. Like, it's very much like a spy thriller that happens to have heroes as a lot of its characters i don't i don't know that there's a ton to like dig and unpack like in that story i will say that like they did a good face-off impression too (laughs) yes yes yeah i liked that a lot that one actually i didn't see it coming but i was not surprised if that makes sense like as soon as i was like okay like of, of course because we've seen that used before like it's not totally out of left field like oh we that's that's happened in other films Mm mm-hmm It was just unclear briefly before that moment happened what side of the fence Melina was going to fall on. And I think that's why it worked so well, because we were like, oh, okay, we're relieved that she didn't like betray them. You know, Natasha was able to get through to all of them in slightly different ways. Oh, yeah. When she was like, like, how how did you not become completely hardened? Like, how did you keep your heart? And she's just like, I know I've been saying that I didn't care about y'all as my family this whole time, but like, these are things that you told me. And then you see that moment of her like, oh, and like some of that psychological conditioning kind of like unravels a little bit. Um, And she kept the photo book that whole time. I know. Yeah. I was like, "Mm -hmm." also like that moment in there, like the little reveal of Natasha being like, oh yeah, like we, we took these three holidays we took the photos for all three of those holidays on the same day. I remember that. And like Yelena doesn't remember that at all. Like she remembers them being like separate events, essentially. Um, I like the way that that like impacts and affects Natasha's character. I think I, I really liked it a lot. Um, Yeah. There's like one big thing that I had a problem with. I wish the timing of this film coming out was different, but like overall I liked it a lot and I really liked the story. I think we're all pretty aligned Mm -hmm. there. Derek, any other story points from you? I want to give a shout out to the prison break scene because that I feel like perfectly captured like the the blend of of action and humor that you get from all of the MCU films and TV shows. And that is something where I feel like once this gets up on Disney Plus and I can watch it for free, I could like just go back and rewatch that scene for 10 or 15 minutes if I had some free time and and be totally uh, happy with it. And it's a great way to, to introduce. Um, it's, it's interesting because you think about um, Black Widow and you think about Falcon and Winter Soldier, like we are starting to introduce these other super soldiers. Like it's not just Steve. Um, and there's, there's so many good mm-hmm. stories that could be worth uh, that, are, that are worth exploring um, later down the line in whatever form they would like to. Yeah, I agree. This was definitely fun. Becky, I know you wanted to talk Easter eggs. I saw a thumbnail for a YouTube video that said there were 97 Easter eggs in this movie. And let me tell you, 
my brain does not pay that much attention. <laughs> um, well, I've only seen this movie once, so I don't yeah. think I noticed 97. I noticed like a handful. Some of the stuff that people will say are like Easter eggs will be things like the Jeeps that were chasing them weren't police cars. They were shield Jeeps. Yeah. And it's like, okay, that's not... That's not an Easter egg. That's, not- that's keeping the canon. They're like, did you notice that they had the shield logo? I'm like, yeah, because they were... Because it was shield. Like, that's not... An- <laughs> Because of course, Shield would be going after Russian spies. Yeah, that's their job. Like, <laughs> that's, their, that's their freaking job. So when people say ninety-seven, I'm like, okay, like how many of these are actually like? Or sometimes it's like multiple eggs, like in one, and they're counting them individually. Maybe there are. I don't know. Maybe we need to revisit it again. I know I've mentioned like I really like like spy comics, um, and so like getting all this time with like Rick Mason, I thought was like really cool. I really loved the banter back and forth between uh, Rick and Natasha a lot. And I think that that was very good. And then a thing that's really interesting, if you're not familiar with like with Rick, Rick is actually um, the son of the Tinkerer. Oh. Who we have been introduced to already in the Marvel movies through Spider-Man Homecoming, right? Um, Mm Mm-hmm. And that's a thing that's like a not very well known and they can choose to not do anything with that at all. But it also might mean that we might see Rick again in some capacity, um, possibly through like Thunderbolts, right? Because now like Yelena um, would also like has also clearly developed this relationship uh, with Rick or maybe somewhere um, anywhere else uh, in the MCU, right? Because we've now had a little bit of that tie in through Spider-Man as well. And so that one was really exciting to me. That one I feel like is fairly obscure. I, when I was younger, I, I really liked comics that weren't necessarily superheroes. Um, and so there are sometimes these like one-off characters that I'm like, oh, that person. And people are like, why would you know that? <laughs> But yeah, so that's that's one that I had. I, I've mentioned two other ones already. Like I talked about Moonraker and I really liked that. I thought that that was fun. Um, Derek, did you have any Easter eggs that you noticed that like you wanted to talk about? I mean, not necessarily an Easter egg, but like it was it was cool to kind of get like the I guess the like the official version of what happened with uh, Black Widow and Hawkeye in in Budapest. Um I don't feel like there was a way to do this film where you get to see that actually happen, but for her to explain like, oh yeah, we were holed up here for days and days and days. We had to do this. We had to do this. It's like, okay, that's, that's cool. That kind of like brings this line from this movie years and years ago, like full circle. And and now I can kind of picture that all happening. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do think that that's really cool also. Another small thing, when Yelena gets out of the 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 car, the truck at the gravesite and the dog follows her and she calls the dog Fanny, like Rick had pulled those fake IDs for Natasha and they said Fanny Longbottom as like her name. And then mm-hmm. Yelena ends up calling her dog Fanny. I thought that that was, that was really funny and that was really sweet. And then speaking of that end scene, so I have not watched Falcon and Winter Soldier. And so I did not realize that Valentina has been introduced to us already. And so I was like, what is happening here? Because Valentina does like a a short stint as like Madame Hydra at one point in the comics. Um, And so I was very confused about like what this character is doing and why they are here. And essentially, right, like she's, now tasked with assembling what we are going to be calling the Thunderbolts. It's interesting too, to see her have this moment where she's just like, Hey, so you can have this opportunity to go after this guy that like is the reason that your sister's dead. And we know that that's not true, right? Because we saw it, but Elena doesn't know that that's not true. No one knows besides Hawkeye because it happened on a planet millions of miles away. And so how does Valentina know anything about it? That's what I want to know. That's a good question. I'm very excited to see because they 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 will have to explain that, right? Yeah. And her her motive for going after Hawkeye in the first place cuz you know, out of out of all of the Avengers, I guess based on everything he did while he was on his little revenge spree during Endgame, they could relate back that that back maybe he he killed some people. 
who she didn't want him to. Yeah, like, are some of these, like, mercenaries um, that had been, like, that were being used, like, for a specific reason? Does he know too much about what she's trying to do with recruiting? What will become the Thunderbolts? Um, And so now he's, like, a risk? Like, I... Mm. But it's clearly setting up like what we can expect out of the show. And I'm already very excited for the Hawkeye show. I think Hawkeye is a very underrepresented and misused character um, in a lot of ways. And I'm very excited to see that show. And I like the way that that was handled in that. I just, it's going to be late this year, right? Like at the back half of this year. And so I'm like, I I don't want to wait anymore. I want to watch it now. But we still have Loki to digest. Yeah, I think it's going to be fall because we have Loki and then they just dropped the What If trailer, which What If will start next month in August. What is that? It's the animated show that's based on like the What If comics. Is that part of this? No, it's totally... Then I don't care. But it's it's like, because every episode is going to be an anthology and it's like, it's the Watcher telling you like... It's like, what if Black Panther was Star Lord? Yeah, and what if Peggy Carter took the super, uh, the super soldier serum, things like that. That I'm interested in. I'll send you the trailer when we are done talking yes. here, so you can decide you. which. Because those will be like contained episodes, so you can watch one and skip the next one, and mm-hmm. just kind of watch the ones you're interested in. Okay, so I really liked when Yelena's like, oh, like, when you're being, like, whoever, whatever, um, that she says, like, crim- crim- the Crimson Dynamo. Oh, yes. As opposed to, like, Red Guardian. I thought that, that was very funny, um, especially because of, like, right, like, they're, like, essentially the Russian uh, Captain America and Iron Man, um, essentially. And so it's very, it's it's very funny. It was a dig, for sure. <laughs> yes, it, it was very funny. Um, and I really appreciated that. So I gave this a three and a half out of five. I had a really good time with it. Derek, how'd you feel about this one? I walked away thinking that it was comfortably like mid to high mid tier. I'm going to go see it again this weekend. And I feel like that a, a second watch is going to really help me settle. I would, pr- I think right now I would give it four out of five stars. Cause like it did everything it needed to. Like it, it was a great spy movie. Like, Natasha is a spy and the whole film felt like a spy and it told a great story about about her family and about her and it did something really impressive where it gave us you know it took a character who's already dead and told a new story about her and did it you know and 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 did it in a great way like you know they didn't make any huge uh, huge mistakes um it, you know, story wise, I absolutely feel like I need a second watch so I can focus on things that aren't just like, okay, what's the plot and how is this going to set up these, you know, these coming TV shows and movies and just really focus on the film and the story itself. I ended up giving it a three out of five. I would say that in the realm of Marvel, however, it would be a four out of five for me. But as a and as an overall film, a three out of five. I try to do my best to just when I walk into like a superhero movie to just like suspend like the way that I normally think about film or like the things that I think about like as being part of re- what's realistic. The last fight scene and then just like how how jarring and how big of like a whole uh, the whole Taskmaster thing was just kind of like really like knocked it back um, a couple of pegs for me. Um, but again. It's a Marvel movie. I had a good time watching it. Like, absolutely. They've certainly made a lot of these movies very rewatchable, I think. Not all of them, obviously. There's definitely like the bottom tier of Marvel where you're like, never need to do that again. Thank you. (laughs) I never need to watch Age of Ultron ever again. Probably not. It's one of the worst movies. I disagree. Derek, don't do it. Derek's an Ultron apologist. Well, not necessarily. I'd say I'm 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 too much of a Marvel stan to feel that way about any of that. If I mean, my example would be Thor. I feel like the first Thor movie is a hot mess. The Thor movies are my least favorite. Like as a as a chunk, as far as the character movies go. Yes. Yes. I think that they're like the weak point. I think Ragnarok is the best Thor movie. I think Loki 
is the best part of the Thor movies. But like as a whole, I think the the Loki films or the I wish they were Loki films. God, you're about to say Loki <laughs> is the best Thor film, and I was going to say uh, that might be true by the end of the TV show. Might be true. The Loki show is the best Thor movie. You heard it here first, everyone. So real quick, recommendations. I've been trying to recommend similar things for people to check out. And mine's just a single comic book issue. Pretty easy to read. It is a little wordy, though, because it's an old one. But if you want to see just how far Black Widow has come, read her first appearance in Tales of Suspense number 52. And that will probably tell you everything you need to know about this character's trajectory from the comics to this movie, basically. It's so different. Like, right, like that, that interpretation of like Natasha and of like Black Widow is so different than like what we got in like, um, I think the big reboot for her came in like 2004. Um, But it wasn't until like the late 90s, early 2000s that we had like a oh, this is a psychologically conditioned character. Like, it was just like, oh, nope, she's just like, that's just how she is. That's a good recommendation. Like, here's like an origin point. So the ones that I have, um, if you want to read more like Black Widow comics, um, I would definitely recommend uh, Black Widow, It's a Busy Spider. Um, It's only like three issues, I believe, and it's from 99. Um, Also, Web of Black Widow. Um, Do not remember when that came out. Um, But it's only like five issues. Um, so it's not very long either. I don't, I don't know. I, I want to plug the Matt Fraction Hawkeye. Yes. It's so good. 2015. I, it's yes. so good. And I, I think that this, I think that if you enjoyed this film or you enjoy Black Widow and Hawkeye as characters, you'll very much like that run. Um, and then if you just really like seeing someone that you've known as a superhero, um, doing a non-superhero thing for a while on their own, um, the Grayson series so that feels weird to like plug like a dc thing here but grayson was really good um and kind of chronicles like dick grayson no longer being robin or batman or nightwing um and is just working as like a private detective um and as a spy um and that series is really interesting if that's a thing that you're into sorry that was a lot of recommendations i don't read comic books (laughs) Nobody here does. You don't read them, you absorb them. So I was not prepared for recommendations. <laughs> I would recommend, um, the, besides the the um, Natasha and Hawkeye uh, comic that was already mentioned, um, just the original Civil War storyline. You can find it in trade paperback. There's tons of, like, each character has their own version of it. There's also just, like, a Civil War. Um, because, like, this this story, like, refers to the MCU Civil War so so often it just reminds me of like i love civil war and it's probably my favorite mcu movie but also the comic version is so good and so different that like you can have seen every single mcu movie and have no idea what happens in the the civil war storyline maybe civil war 2 to a lesser extent but it's not it's not nearly as good as the original civil war arc I will just add that you probably don't have to read all like 500 tie-in issues, but if you you read the main arc and if you have Marvel Unlimited, it will tell you what all of the tie-in issues are. I'm a a person who is not fond of comic book events because they get too big, but I will read the main series and then ignore everything else. I like a few of them. Um, In fact, I would say, like, I would read Civil War Thunderbolts if you're interested in Marvel and you have not, you're not familiar with Thunderbolts. I think that that's a good entry point, maybe, for some of those. Um, The Miss Marvel ones are also very good. I agree. I tend to agree with the, and I'm not normally into, like, events because there's too much stuff going on, but I do think that Civil War was very, very good. I know why they did, but I was disappointed at the choice to call Captain America Civil War that because it made me wish that there was some way to do a cinematic representation of the Civil War comic event. And there's just not. There's just too much going on there. But yeah, always a lot going on in those events that have all of the heroes, all of them. But that wraps up our discussion on Black Widow. Derek and Becky, thank you so much for joining me. It's a blast, as always, to talk to you, too. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, for having us. (laughs) 
<laughs> yes, this is this is such a fun time. All right, everyone, that does it for this episode of Welcome to Geekdom. If you want to support the podcast, you can do so through our Patreon. If you want to follow us on socials, you can do so at Geekdom Pod on Twitter and at Welcome to Geekdom on Instagram and Facebook. And as always, thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.